Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, the first question that I'm going to ask everybody anyway is, of course, how did Doctor Who happen for the two of you? John, do you want to go first? Yes, you um, do. I have to do it? No, 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 no it's, it's all. Oh, okay, right. Ah. Um, <laughs> um, very simple. Um, I got asked in for a casting. Uh, they said I looked quite monkey. <laughs> um, I had a, quite a big beard going and my hair was like dishevelled and um, did the casting, went really well and um, then they just went, that's great Sean, we really like you, one thing, can you ride a horse? And I went, of course, <laughs> obviously I couldn't um, and then I, so I thought, you know, I'll learn before, if, if they offer me the part, I'll learn beforehand. And I got the call saying, yep, uh, you've got the part. And so then I booked like 10 horse riding sessions uh, with someone, got pretty good at it, went on to set, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, Sean, all the horse stuff has been cut. <laughs> uh, and I was like, good, good, <laughs> thank you. Um, which is kind of good anyway, because I didn't actually become that good at riding a horse, so yeah. Anyway, that's not quite part of the question, but I thought I'd add it in. <laughs> that, that's one of the lies on every actor's CV, though, yeah. isn't it? Horse riding, sword fighting, yeah. ballet. The, yeah. 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 And, John, how did you get into Doctor Who? I, I was just asked to join. I didn't do an audition or interview. They just rang me up and said, would you like to do a, a Doctor Who? And I said, yes. I was, I was in a Shakespeare play at the time, so I didn't have a lot of free time to do uh, it. So, but yes, it was a great um, pleasure and honour to be in this iconic television. Mm. So, I just got it. I don't really remember a great deal. You'll have to all help me <laughs> to remember what I did and how I did it and <laughs> how long ago it was. I, I have very little memory about it, apart from that everyone was very, very nice. Yeah. And, and how did you get into acting in the first place? Ah, uh, my parents were in the theatre. Oh. So, I was born in the dressing room, practically. My parents were in variety something that mm, some of you may remember. And um, my dad worked at the London Palladium about eight times and worked with the crazy gang of the Victoria Palace. So I was brought up and I met my first actor. My parents said, oh, this is Bernard Miles. And this actor walked down the corridor and I'd never seen anything quite like that before. But actors didn't look like variety artists. The variety artists were rather wealthy and dressed very well. And the actors were very poor, I remember, and seemed to dress in rags. But that, that's, that's how I got the bug, really. So uh, when Bernard Miles built the Mermaid Theatre in the, in, the, in the 60s, my parents were asked to work there, and uh, I did my first kind of ASM work there before I went to drama school and then went into repertory for about eight years before I did my first television. The, in, 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 so yes, I learned it the hard way, but... It's very nice to do so. Right, so you had drama school and rep. Yeah, rep for the, rep for the first eight years, mostly doing the classics. So I never, never knew what doing modern dialogue was. <laughs> so it was, came as a great joy, and it's quite easy to do compared with doing, you know, the Chaucer's and the Philip Marlowe's and things like that um, plays. Do you think modern theatre is missing out on rap? Oh, yes, I do, because when you go to the theatres nowadays, it's very difficult to, um, particularly young actors, to hear what they're saying. They, a, they mumble. I'm sure you, re you recognise the mumbling that goes on on television, where you can hardly hear what they're saying. And in films, it's exactly the same thing. They're not articulating. And I blame, I, mean, I just, I blame what? The, the, the sound engineer, the director saying, or you've got the sound man with the cans on, you've got the director with the cans on. Can't they hear that the actors are mumbling? Mm -hmm. because so I, I'm a member of BAFTA and I have to vote for these films and I feel like saying what did he say? What was that last thing he said? Because I can't hear it but anyway it's, it's frustrating and you get that in the theatre as well Some young actors simply do not know how to project and no articulation yeah. lazy vocabulary a, a friend of mine who works for Lipper was saying students, drama students these days always expect to be radio mic'd so they don't project. And of course what they don't realise is that radio mics fail roughly 87% of the time. So, so yeah, Sean, yeah, Sean did, you, did you come from a theatrical dynasty or did you have another way into the profession? Uh, uh, no, no theatrical dynasty, but I did um, go to um, old school drama centre and uh, that was, well, 
what we're talking about, like the proper method acting, theatre work, <laughs> and yeah, unfortunately, in Drama Centre was all about deconstruction, reconstruction, so they kind of destroyed you and built you back up <laughs> kind of thing. It was quite heavy. <laughs> Um, I've heard about it. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to tell some <coughs> of the stories. Uh, they're probably not appropriate. Um, but yeah, no, it was a you know proper old school. I mean, I I, I came out of there, and my first audition was um, uh, for the first Pirates of the Caribbean for the lead role, and uh, it went Blue yeah, was, yeah. For the, um, and I was just like, <coughs> wow, this is weird, and I realised that I hadn't ever been on camera before because it was so theatre orientated. Yeah. I, I'd never been on camera before, and it was weird. But then after that, all I ever do is camera stuff. I, I don't really do theatre anymore. Was that a difficult adaptation from, from theatre to camera? Because I'm told oh. on camera you have to be much smaller, which um, doesn't explain Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, uh, no, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, no, it was more the audition process. You couldn't be quite so flamboyant because that was my... W after doing that audition, the notes that came back were like, oh, Sean's too big, it's too like this and like that. I was like, ah, okay, let's change this up a little bit. But to be honest, film, and film was always my passion, uh, hence why I also got into producing. But um, don't get me wrong, I love theatre, but as I've done so much TV and film now, um, casting directors don't see me as a theatre actor. They just kind of go, oh, he does that, he doesn't do this. Which is weird, considering, well, we're actors, we can do a few things, can't we? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. They love putting you in a box. Yeah, yeah, I know. But there are some wonderful stories to tell about about actors saying yes to everything and oh, then not yeah. being I mean, the horse the horse thing. I've had one of those as well. Yeah, <laughs> those moments of saying yes, I can do it, and then going off and learning how to do it, and then yeah. being thrown off the horse. And <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So it's dangerous by saying yes to everything. Yes, so the no is very good sometimes. <laughs> and that's uh, that something you've got in common then is as you're a BAFTA member and you produce is that you work behind the scenes as it were as well as. Oh, in front of the stage. Do you find that equally compelling as being in the limelight, or is it more rewarding in another way? No, as BAFTA members, uh, it's all you have to be a member of the, of the profession for many years. No, we're just ju we just judge the films. Oh, that's we judge great. the films, the director, the in, in all the sixteen about sixteen character uh, categories from best actor to best actress, uh, supporting, writing, cinematography, costumes, makeup, script. And so it's difficult. I mean, I, I saw 110 films last year, and I probably have to see another 110 this year. Although there were about 230 films released, can you can you believe it? 230 films released last year in the UK. It's a lot, and you do see some awful oh. stuff. <laughs> awful stuff. <laughs> what does one do with the other 135 days of the year? Uh, I. You're asking me personally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pause it there, if I may, because we have one of your uh, fellow James Bond alumni has now joined us. Will you please join me, ladies and gentlemen? He's only been in bloody everything. It's Shane Rimmer. <laughs> uh, no, how am I getting that? There should be stairs there, Mr. Romano. Where am I going here? I'm afraid so. There we go. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, Mr. Rimmer has been in uh, Superman, Batman, James Bond on three occasions. Um, everything, every genre show it's possible to imagine. And um, some bad ones that you don't mention at all. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I, I forgot Whoops Apocalypse, yes. But oh, we'll, right. uh, yeah. um, first you. things first, I'll ask you the same questions I asked the other two gentlemen. How did Doctor Who come about for you, Mr. Emma? Doctor Who came about. Let me think. I didn't, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I, no, I, I think it was just a call-up. Um, Seth Harper uh, obviously spoke with a Western 
American Western accent. So I think that that, that was the first requirement. <laughs> How you acted didn't matter too much. No, uh, I'd always had a yen uh, to meet up with William. Uh, and I, I found him an intriguing character. Um, when I first came on set, um, he came over to me. I, I had been doing a, a, f a few scattered comments about things. He said, uh, you're the real thing, are you? And not knowing really what he meant, but knowing that he wasn't terribly excited about American voices or who was behind them, uh, I said, um, well, yes, I'm just trying to get this part straight. And he said, are you from above or below the Mason-Dixon line <laughs> in America? And I said, uh, I'm above the Mason-Dixon line quite a long ways. He said, what do you mean? I said, Canada. <laughs> we don't do that kind of thing in Canada. Well, some do. So anyway, that, we, that cleared the air. We got along quite well after that. I was surprised. He's a very warm chap. Uh, but he doesn't like uh, certain things, and he doesn't make any pretense about it. He's an amazing man. Because I think, uh, I don't know how old he was when I met him. Almost as old as I am, I thought. Anyway, he had this incredible talent of feeding people a kind of energy. It's an amazing thing. Uh, you could see it almost happening in front of you. Uh, so anything that was plotted, anything that was being performed, got an instant sort of rise to it. I think that's, I don't know, well, I'd be getting too fanciful. I think that was one of the reasons why um, Doctor Who has stayed in the race, you know, because it's so well performed, it's so enthusiastically led by, uh, by William that um, it can't fail. Anyway, I, I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed uh, the session with him. Uh, didn't get into any arguments. It was very nice. So there we are. Right. I think one of the reasons Doctor Who is so successful as well is that it has such strength and depth with character actors like yourselves playing even the smaller parts. Yeah. You know, it's the whole cast that works together. I'm going to jump on something that you said there because um, you you were mistaken for an American at that meeting. But yes. I, I think John can actually go one better because if I've done my research correctly, John, you were press ganged into the French army. Am I right in saying? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was. Uh, I, I was on a holiday in, in near Marseille, and uh, Cannes, actually, and I, I walked into the hotel, and I saw three German gendarmes at the reception, and I said, uh, bonjour, and I went up to my room. The, in, the telephone rang, and they said, would you please come down with your passport? I did, and the gendarme said, I'm afraid you're under arrest for draft dodging. And I said, <laughs> I said but I'm a British subject. Uh, here's my passport. He said, yes, but uh, you were born in Strasbourg. And that was France in 19, uh, when you were born, 39. It was German before that, but it was France. And so I said, oh, so he said, we're going to take you to Marseille and you will be court-martialed for draft dodging. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I went off to Marseille. They took me off to, I was put in prison. I took me off to Marseille. I was court-martialed, found innocent of the charge of draft dodging when they realized I would brought up right from 1939 in England, Nottinghamshire. Uh, and um, I was acquitted of that, so I thought I was going to walk out of the courtroom free. They said, well, no, now, now you're going and doing your military service. You've been acquitted of draft dodging, now you're going to do your military service. And this was during the Algerian War, and so I was stationed in Marseille and in Algiers, and I was in the, the not the parachute, the transport company that transport to the parachutists and the foreign legionnaires to the areas of conflict. And it was a very dangerous uh, um, corps to be in because uh, that, that's when you were in these long convoys of 500 trucks being <coughs> going out to the desert to fight the uh, FLN. Um, the first thing they'd do would just shoot the drivers of the, of the lorries, which would then stop the lorries, and then they could then f pour fire down onto the convoy. 
So uh, I did see some things, but anyway, uh, the captain, the captain of my, my, my I got an, a telephone call from headquarters saying the British Navy are in Marseille and they would like to have a courtesy coach to take some of the, the ratings and the sailors around south, southern France, which is something the French army did as soon as the British Navy came into port. So I went to the captain and I said, could, could I be co-driver? Because I can speak English and they can't speak French. And he said, only if you give your word as an English gentleman will I allow you to go. So I went to, I was the co-driver of this coach, and I, we got to the, to the port, and there was the, the two summaries and a factory ship, and the ratings came on board, and this went on for three days, and I was in my French uniform, and I said, you don't, but at Chaps, I said, actually, I talked with a bit of a North Country accent by then, and I said, uh, I'm actually English, you know. And they said, what? I said, well, I know I'm uh, in the uniform, but I'm actually English. And this story, after three days, got through to the captain of the factory ship. And uh, when, uh, the last day, it, this, they came down and said, the captain of the ship would like to meet you, John. <laughs> so I went up right. to the captain and he said, I've just heard this incredible story that you're a British subject and you're in the French army. You've been drafted into the army. And he said, listen, we sail at midnight. <laughs> if you want to stay on board, we'll take you out back to England. And I said, I said, it's so kind, but I gave my word as an English gentleman to the captain of my company that I'd return and I can't let him down. <laughs> yeah. But I see, the thing, of course, the reason, again, is that if I'd have deserted then, um, I'd never have been, been able to go back to France. So I eventually, after 24 months, I renounced my French citizenship and came back to England and started out as an actor. <laughs> That's a great story. Bad, wasn't it? Not too bad, not too bad. No, but in in the company with me there were two Spaniards, two Italians, a German, and an American. <laughs> and I saw this American in the parade ground, fifty-six years old he was. And I went over and I said, "Do you speak English?" He said, "Oh God, yeah." He said, "I said, how? Why are you here?" He said, "Well." My parents and I immigrated to America when I was 13 years old, and now 56, and I thought I'd come back with my wife and kids and show them the mother country, the father country, and I was, I was in, in Paris after three days, and they came and arrested me <laughs> for draft dodging. And, and they bust him back down to Marseille, and his kids and his wife were up in Paris and didn't know where he'd gone. They knocked on the door, and they just picked him. You can't escape the French army. Oh you really Unless can't. Unless you're the German army, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. It yeah. is, isn't it? Oh, what a story. That's so cool. Uh, Sean, have you ever so been mistaken <laughs> for an Algerian or draft, <laughs> drafted into the Venusian Air Force? <laughs> no, but I'm slightly scared. Because, yeah. um, as you say, like, this, mu well, from those other people, this happens more than just to yourself. No, it happens, <laughs> yeah. So you, can, you know that every year... Several people are just getting drafted into the army at yeah. 50 years old. If you're born in France, uh, even if you've got foreign parents, if you're born in France, you're a French citizen. That's brilliant. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a good thing to know. A good thing yeah. to know. Next but time I'm born, I'll make sure it's not in France. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to um, hijack you for a moment to talk about um, some projects that I myself am very fond of. That's all right. I'll start with you, Sean, if mm. I may. Now, there's a wonderful science fiction author, I don't know if you know of him, called Michael Marshall Smith, uh, who, is, who is a genius of science fiction. And um, when I was doing my research, I, I hadn't come across this for some reason, but one of his stories, The Seventeenth Kind, was adapted into a, a half-hour film starring um, Sylvester McCoy, Brian Blessed, Miriam Margulies, um, Tony um, Curran, who was Vincent in Vincent van Gogh, and... Lucy Pinder, <laughs> who uh, I, I'm sure you all know is a successful businesswoman with her own cosmetics range and apparently some sort of model. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it's all right, Erica, it was research. Um, <laughs> uh, and you produced this remarkable film. How did that come about? What did you, how did you go about it? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, basically... Um, uh, I have a production company uh, with uh, an, an, a friend of mine and we'd made a, a couple of feature films and we teamed up with another company uh, and before embarking on uh, doing a feature film together we wanted to do a short film to see how well we work together and blah 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 and we all love um, sci-fi and uh, Andy from the other com company said oh um 
I really like this short story from Michael Marshall Smith. It's really bizarre about an alien takeover of a QVC station. Um, it's so bizarre. And um, we like, so we contacted him and we're like, do you mind us doing an adaptation? And he was like, yeah, you know, great, brilliant. I, I love the fact that you love that. No one's read that one. It's one of the, you know, the more obscure ones. He's like, yeah, do it. He gave us the rights. My business partner adapted it. And then, um, yeah, and then we thought, well, the only way to do this is to get in people who are, you know, um, in that sci-fi world or connected somehow. And, yeah, and so we just got a, quite a big casting director on board, one that had a bit of clout, and just went, these are the people we want. And she went, okay, made a few phone calls, agreed on fees, and suddenly I walk on set and everyone's in their trailer. Oh, yeah, Ralph Brown as well from yes. Withnell and I. Yeah. yeah, and lots of other things. Um, yeah, that was, it was bizarre. It was, yeah. And Brian, I love Brian. <laughs> we did, it was meant to be an hour's worth of voiceover because he plays uh, the alien, and it ended up being six hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were actually going to start, going to do a little documentary on him uh, because it was just fascinating. It was just, it, 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 he, he would say one of the alien lines and then go into a story for about <laughs> half an hour. And then, like that, but we were all there like this going, I don't care what he says, just, just talk, just talk. It, and yeah, it, it was, oh, it's great. Mir all of them, it's just, yeah, I mean, and Sylvester had to do it, his little spoon trick. In the, <laughs> does a sp anyway, it's, it's very funny. It, it's, it's very funny. It's called The Seventeenth Kind. I think, I, think you can, I think you can watch it for free now um, somewhere. I'm putting it up on Amazon Prime soon as well, so that will be for free if you're Amazon Prime. But yeah, it's worth a little watch. It's a giggle. But yeah, sounds fantastic. Um, yeah. But yeah, but that would. But we we only really do feature films uh, now. That was just a little tester, but it, it came out rather nicely. <laughs> Brilliant! Oh, I can't wait to see the whole thing. Um, thinking of of people who tended to cause production overruns, um, Mr. Emmett, you <laughs> were in one of my all time favourite films. Surely one of the greatest films ever made, uh, Doctor Strange Love. Directed yeah. by the incomparable <coughs> and never-ending Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. How was that as an experience? How was what? Being in Doctor mm -hmm. Strange, love. Uh, well, I was supposed to come over. There's a fellow called Dick Lester, who uh, later on, from the time we're talking about now, uh, hooked up with the Beatles and did uh, Long Day's Night and, and uh, I think Yellow Submarine. At that time, he, he was born in Philadelphia. Right. So he wanted to come to uh, uh, the continent because it, it, and uh, this part of the world because uh, Philadelphia was a bit straight laced and, and he was having an un uncomfortable time. So um, we met and uh, now how did this happen? Oh yeah, he was he was um, going to do uh, a, a big musical with Ella Fitzgerald in London. This is the kind of thing he did. He was a, an entrepreneur and a writer and this and that. And he said uh, his wife was a choreographer and we'd, we'd got together a couple of times with, uh, with shows. And he, he said, um, why don't you come on over to England? Uh, I've got Ella Fitzgerald about to sing uh, tuning up, and uh, I'd like you to be a sort of a partner. I couldn't believe it. You know, he probably did it so he'd make Ella Fitzgerald look like a, a real star. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I was just about to go over there, and he got a message saying because of ill health, which she had unfortunately quite a lot, uh, she couldn't she couldn't make the date. And so I was all ready to junk in my ticket when he said, "Look, come on over anyway." It's a bit busy over here now, and I think I can find something for you. So it won't be a waste of time for you. I went over, and he did. He got me the, um, Stanley Kubrick was uh, just then doing Dr. Strangelove, as, as you mentioned. And uh, I ended up being Peter Sellers' uh, co-pilot 
I'd done a few things in Toronto, but not nothing of, of this sort of stature. I mean, this was anyway. I loved I loved Kubrick. Everybody did. The only people who didn't like Kubrick were the uh, people who ran Hollywood, he, because he was never. He the thing he didn't like to do was pin himself down to do a particular. Uh, sort of situation in a movie. He he ran it the way he wanted to do yeah. it. But he made so much money for Hollywood and then the uh, the 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 people there that they didn't want to let him go. So he he kept on course and kept the going. Anyway, what was I saying? I I I kept myself confused. You know, every once in a while I think. <laughs> and, and so. <clears throat> Uh, there we are. We had, uh, and this was, I think it was uh, James Earl Jones' yes. first picture outside of Hollywood. Yes. Yeah. Honestly, when he spoke, the, the whole world shook. I mean, yeah. he had this incredible, incredible voice. Ron Bassett again. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, we decided that uh, we better get down to uh, Shepard and Studios where the uh, where the picture was going to shoot, meet uh, uh, Kubrick, and uh, you know, sort of settle in. So, w which we did. Uh, we went down there and uh, got everything fitted in and had our dressing rooms allocated and all this sort of thing. Kubrick was a gentleman, a gentleman. Uh, and he helped us very much through, uh, because none of us had been in a big uh, studio before like mm. this. I mean, and everywhere you looked, it was big, very big. So, uh, we didn't, uh, oh yes, the next day, the next day, something was unexpected happened. And, and what it was, was Peter Sellers, who was, uh, Unfortunately, taking a, a, a course in uh, <coughs> sort of calming down from a, from a doctor in Switzerland. And he was sort of uh, on edge a lot of the time. Anyway, um, he was, uh, all of a sudden, he had this thing about Kubrick, who he thought was, I don't know, uh, defaming him in some sort of way or making things tough for him. Mm. And when we got into the, the this B bomber, this American bomber, was hung from the ceiling, a huge, yeah. huge thing. And uh, we were in there, we were in there for 13 weeks. That's uh, wow. a bit of a <laughs> encumbrance, to say, <laughs> to say the least. Anyway, um, there we were, and all of a sudden, uh, he got up, Sellers, and rushed to the front of the to the nose of the plane. Well, at the beginning of the uh, of, of the shoot, the nose of the plane was cut off because uh, the camera crew needed to get a, a shot at the uh, at the flight deck. Well, Sellers forgot all about this, and he kept on going and hit thin air. Oh, is that how he broke his leg? That's how he oh. broke his leg. And he, he uh, fell almost 10 feet to the ground. And there was Kubrick, not, not knowing what to do. His, his main actor, his chief actor, was lying there in, 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 in terrible sort of strength. Anyway, that's how Sellers uh, zoomed around uh, Dr. Strangelove in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk. Yeah. And that's why he was replaced by Slim Pickens as the bomber pilot. And Slim Pickens finally came over because he had to move somewhere. I mean, he, he had to, the, 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 uh, he, just, he just couldn't, uh, <laughs> he, he, he couldn't face being pushed around or trying to get himself around the studio <coughs> floor. So that wasn't a bad move and that wasn't a bad something to happen because Slim Pickens was a, quite a character. He ran a, a, he ran a ranch. Uh, in the San Fernando Valley and trained horses for movies. Um, and he was absolutely delighted to hop on a plane and come over and work for uh, uh, Kubrick, who is one of his heroes. Uh, and it worked out very well. I mean, nobody could understand it because of his accent he had. <laughs> so I don't know how, I don't know what happened to the uh, 
cinema going public, trying to figure him out. But he was a he, he was a lovely fella. So that's that, that's how it happened. It was the most uh, everything seemed to be going wrong with the film. You know, the, yeah. the star uh, all of a sudden wasn't able to operate. And uh, uh, anyway, it it it. It turned out okay, and then Slim Pickens received uh, t tremendous sort of applause uh, for the work he did. Yes. Uh, and, and he was quite outstanding. And that last shot, when it was yeah. zooming down. On the bomb. Uh, in, in, in Russia, when he was straddling the, uh, straddling the bomb like a horse. Mm -hmm. They cut it before it hit the ground, so I don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I, I I hadn't thought of that for such a long time, so I'm stumbling around a little bit. But it was a totally enjoyable uh, time. And uh, Kubrick, uh, I met Kubrick about 20 years later. Oh, yes. Because his wife was a painter, and uh, she was uh, presenting some of her p uh, paintings up uh, just north of Barnard, where we were. And she talked him into coming up and saying hello. Uh, which he which he did. He got out of this strange old Mercedes. It must have been about thirty years old, dressed in a checkered shirt, dungarees, and and boots, which he wore all the time. Yeah. I I don't think he had a suit. <laughs> anyway, he, he loved him, man. We had about a half an hour there talking about things that we had uh, run into or hadn't run into, and it was a delight, delightful uh, little time. Fantastic, and that that is interesting to me. I don't know if anybody has seen the life of death, life and death of Peter Sellers, but in that it strongly imply, implied that Peter Sellers broke his leg, or pretended to break his leg deliberately to get he out of plane. So that yeah. that that's very interesting. I could chat mm. about that for ages, but I'm aware nobody else in the room gives a damn. So, <laughs> and and I did promise them that uh, we we'd uh, we'd talk to John about working with Sirian McKellen or the Great Intelligence as we know him uh, in Broadway. Yeah, I was um, I was doing the Tempest uh, in a theatre, and Caroline Blakerson just came to see the show. And when they when the Actors Company was first formed by Ian McKellen, um, they needed a, a second actor and also a fight director. And as I'm also an equity mm, registered fight director, stage fighting, you know, swords and punches and things like that. They needed because they were doing three classical plays in which the fights took place. Um, and um, so she recommended to Ian and the company that I should join, and I was the 17th member. And uh, we stayed together for about th three years, and we did lots of tours and three or four Edinburgh festivals, and then we were invited by New York to come over and do four of our plays, and one which Lear and Taming of the Shrew, not uh, Lear and... Um, Way of the World and uh, Chekhov and, um, and a, a review by R.D. Lang, but um, and I think we made a film of it anyway. And it's interesting because I did see um, the documentary that Ian's made about his life at the BAFTA yesterday. In fact, and it's interesting because he was. It was a. It was a. There were no um, no bosses. The actors were the bosses. The actors were given a budget by the Arts Council and said, do what you want. And we chose the actors and we chose the plays and we chose the the costumes and we chose everything. And it was, it was just an extraordinary turn of events. The actors were in control <laughs> the only time, I think. Yeah. And um, we didn't always make good choices in terms of directors. It's very difficult, you know, for 17 people to say, which director they wanted to work with. It's, it's really difficult. Maybe it's better to be more conventional and have a director of former company and choose his actors. But it was very successful. And, uh, and, and we did make a film, a couple of films, using the same company. And um, Felicity, Felicity Kendall, of course, was the, one of the founder members. So that, yes, so that was interesting, touring mm. around. And um, and the fights, of course. Um, uh, Ian got injured in New York with doing King Lear, and uh, you do, you do. Swords, things happen in a fight. The swords break, blades snap. Um, people forget the moves and start improvising, which can be very dangerous. You know, we've all come across that. And uh, so yes, yeah, so I've I've choreographed fights in Tokyo and Vienna and Madrid, as well as acting in these places. We did three tours of the world doing Shakespeare. So. 
Thinking of which, um, yeah, thinking of fights going awry, I'd like to thank these gentlemen here in the front row for their bravery, because I believe there was an incident where an audience member got involved in one of your sword fighting scenes. Uh, I was, I, yes, I was in a big fight at the Mermaid, and uh, my sword snapped. It was a cutlass. It was Treasure Island. And the sword snapped and hit someone in the front row, across her face. The half like you. The mm -hmm. la last cutlass. It, they, uh, it, you, you hire these weapons from Baptist, and you don't know how many fights they've been in, and it's really metal fatigue. Yeah. They just go, an unknown time, they just go. So I always, as a fight director, always placed secondary weapons in and around the set that if it just happened, at least they knew where a, 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 another sword was, because all of a sudden, if you're doing, I don't know, doing the Scottish play, <coughs> and uh, all of a sudden, Macduff has no sword because it's broken and he has the one that has to kill himself uh, and he <laughs> has no sword to do it with. So, <laughs> which happened when I was doing it in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 luckily someone was standing in the wings and saw, saw what happens watching the fight and he rushed on as one of the characters and handed <laughs> him. There you go. <laughs> it, it, it's a, yes, it can be dangerous. And, uh, it, it, and it's oddly, oddly enough, when we, when we did it in Tokyo, we did Romeo and Juliet in Tokyo, we, and the first night, it was a 2,000-seater, and we did the play, we took our bows, the curtain came down, we all went back to our dressing rooms, and about five or six minutes later, the stage manager on the, on the public address system said, could John and Richard please come down to the stage, no matter what dress, state of dress you're in, come down with your foils, uh, rapiers, in fact. And so... We went down there and the stage manager met us and he said, I said, what are we doing? He said, I've just paged this, the curtains and no one in the audience have left. They're all sitting there still. And I went out and said to them, uh, the show is over, you can leave. And they said, no, we want to see the fight again. <laughs> so, so, so first night, first night in Tokyo, the curtains went up and I as Tybalt and the other actor Richard playing Mikusho, we did this extraordinary fight together. And they'd never seen a Western fight with rapiers because they normally have the Japanese swords. And so they'd never, they were so curious. And, and, and everywhere we went in Japan, they wanted to see the fight again. <laughs> Forget the play, let's see yeah. the fight. Let's see the fight. Now that, that's, actually, that sounds funny, but I believe in Shakespeare's day, um, when the globe was dark, they would stage sword fights for public entertainment. I would imagine, yeah. yeah. I don't know how good they were. No, no. Uh, how good the fighting, whether it was, was choreographed. It's not, it never mentioned. I mean, choreograph. Uh, I mean, I, th I think... I don't know, maybe the actors... I mean, I started out, when I was first in rep, doing the first fight, although I w I'd learned to do it at drum school. But uh, they didn't carry, a lot of companies didn't carry fight directors. They, the actors uh -huh. had to muddle through and, and, and somehow choreograph a fight. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That, in, apparently, in, the reason there are lots of fight, sword fights in Romeo and Juliet is to stop the men getting bored and wandering off. Because it, it was the equivalent of throwing in a few big explosions, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's a shame they don't have secondary swords at all theatres, because uh, if they'd had that when John Wilkes Booth was around, Abraham Lincoln would still be alive today. Yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that's true. But, I mean, you, extraordinary things can happen. I, in, in, in that same production, uh, at, at four weeks rehearsal, I was playing Ben Gunn at the time. And, oh. and uh, who was playing? Oh, uh, um, Barry Rushton. Barry Rushton was playing Long John Silver. Can you believe it? I, was, I won't say what, what happened anyway, and it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I have to be more discreet, but uh, we rehearsed it, and there is a, the big fight with about 20 or 22 actors on stage fighting Cutlers, the pirates, and the people in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the, I suppose, what do you call it, a kind of encampment, and I gave the captain, he never used his fire, I, 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 swords, I gave him pistols, so he would shoot a pirate and then shoot another pirate and hand the empty guns to Jim Hawkins. He would give him two full pistols. And so I said, well, in rehearsal, will you just say bang and bang when you shot so the actor knows when to, to fall over dead? Well, on the first night, believe it or not, the actor, he had got real guns now, he actually said bang, <laughs> bang. And I said to him afterwards, I said, do you know what you've just done? I said, isn't what? I said, you said bang, rather than pulling the trigger. <laughs> he said, no. I said, yeah. 
<laughs> four weeks of going bang, bang, you know, you, you're getting in, in the heat of the moment to forget to pull the triggers and say bang instead. But I don't know what the audience made of it, seeing a, a pirate fall down dead after being shouted bang at. I don't know. <laughs> Wow. He's allergic to the word bang. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that, that, I mean, at, at least that's safe when somebody doesn't fire their guns. I mean, audience is being hit in the head with, with a, a, a sword. Uh, lead actors breaking their legs. These are bad enough for the actors. For producers, this must be a nightmare. Have you ever had anything like that happen to you, Sean, in your productions? Um, no. Right. <laughs> okay, well, no. make one happen and come back next year. I mean... Well, uh, just really quickly, um, not in any of my productions, but it, on, you know, on lots of productions I've been in as an actor, there's always some little thing that happens, you know, over the course of like two months of filming and whatever. But funnily enough, um, something I'd never experienced before was um, I've just finished on this American feature film. It's an 80s sci-fi called Transients. And I was going on to do a night shoot. So I was there with... I was playing a deputy sheriff, and so I was traveling out with the sheriff onto set at 11 o'clock at night, got there, and everyone's kind of like, uh, and, they, and what had happened, um, uh, the, the two leads had been uh, sent in a car, just literally, I mean, I think about a, few, a couple of thousand meters up the road to get a quick costume change, and their car got clipped by a lorry. And... Uh, and it got written off. They all got sent to hospital, but nothing, nothing bad happened. But they had to be sawed out of the car, Oof. and and you're like, it never before has that has that ever happened where it's like not on set because when you're filming, you think you're in this you're in this weird world, this weird bubble, and nothing can kind of happen outside of it, and this and that. You know what I mean? Mm. And then mm. suddenly you get suddenly thrust back into the real world and trying to go, go whoa, that's... Um, I mean, nothing happened, but it was, just one, it was just really curious because it's never... You just forget about those yeah. things that happen in life when you're all nicely protected in your film set or yeah. whatever, yeah. or theatre thing. You know what yeah, I mean, yeah, don't cocoon, you? You, yeah. you have this, yeah, this protective blanket around you where nothing can really happen outside. But yeah, so just goes to show. A tunnel vision effect. So yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, thank you all very much for indulging in my peculiar obsessions. I'm sure the audience are absolutely champing at the bit to indulge in some of theirs. So I'll throw it open to the audience, if I may. Have we any questions for any of these gentlemen? No. They're obviously very satisfied. That, yeah. That's really taken me by surprise. I don't, we haven't even touched on the subject of James Bond. Have we no James Bond fans in? Yes. Do we have a question from the lady in the in the lovely neck scarf? Oh, right. <laughs> you do some work for a change. Come on. <laughs> um, it's an absolute uh, privilege to meet two actors who have been on uh, in James Bond. So can uh, we have an anecdote or two, please, about? Uh, Shane, I know that you were in more than one Bond because uh, we enjoy spotting you in different Bond movies. It's very exciting. But also, John, you were in Bond uh, as well. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Uh, it's, it's an incredible experience. Uh, it's such a big, mega uh, film operation. Uh, you expect it to be like other film operations that have that sort of size and that sort of power. Uh, but there's something about a Bond setup that completely takes you unawares. It's the most comfortable and the warmest sort of situation you, you can come into as, a, as an actor. It's a family oriented situation, uh, and that's just the way they are. Brock Cubby was uh, exactly the same, and Barbara. Uh, broccoli is just carried on, um, and 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 it was a surprise, and it it, it 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 was a big surprise when Connery carried on this sort of anti-broccoli uh, thing he had, because broccoli really brought Connery to life as a as an actor. 
uh, don't know what happened. It was it was quite a, an interesting situation, playing with both Connery and uh, Roger Moore, uh, and the difference. Connery uh, took his job as a as as a, a lead actor very seriously. Uh, Roger Moore, not so much. He never turned your back. He never turned your back on Roger Moore. You wouldn't know whether he had a head left. It was the same. <laughs> but Roger then had to rely on. He couldn't com combat uh, Connery with the way Connery worked. He was big. He was uh, tough, uh, and he had. So what he had to do was use finesse and charm and uh, <laughs> be sure. Anyway, he, 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 uh, he did that, uh, and it worked. Um, so he, was, he, was, he had to give him credit because he, he came in and took over that part, which had already been stylized into the kind of bond that uh, people expected it to be. But uh, with, with, with Roger, it took a little while for the thing to settle so that people accepted him as a James Bond character. But uh, it's still a mystery why Connery didn't uh, loosen up a little bit. I, I think, you know, he, I think he came out of a, a chorus line, uh, but he, he was the right, the right look, the right size, the right everything. And I don't know why he didn't enjoy himself just a little bit more. But he, anyway, I mean, I, you know, I mean, the, the Bond uh, franchise is one of the most successful in the world. They can get anybody they want, any any story they want, they can uh, they can get, they can have. Uh, so it, it, it it's quite an amazing thing. Again, that it's such a warm and a comfortable uh, situation to come into. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Arch. And Mr. Renning? Oh, oh, yes, I can give you one anecdote. Uh, I may have to stand up to do it completely because it does involve a visual effect. Um, I think it's on a third day where we were, I was told, to, the car took me to a location, which I thought was a location, which looked like a very miniature bus station. And, and I got out of the car, I went in there, and there was the second assistant there, and I said, um, Right, where is everybody? He said, oh, well, they're on location. You'll be taken there in a few moments. And I said, um, um, is it very far? He said, no, it's just up the hill. So I said, oh, fine. Oh, uh, <clears throat> how are we going to get there? Is, is there a bus coming? He said, no, you're, going and you're taking that. And it looked like a very miniature carriage. I don't know, bus uh, lorry. And he said, it's, 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 a, it's a car. I said, that's a car? He said, yes, it's called a cable car, John. And I said, well, where are we going in that? And he said, I'll show you. He said, uh, come to the window. And he said, um, you see up there? See that mountain top? He said, yeah, we're going up there. I said, in that? He said, yeah, up there, in the cable, up there. I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, Roger came in. And uh, I said, Roger, I said, we're going in the cable car. He said, yeah, I know. I said, we're going all the way up there, that mountain. He said, yes, I know. I said, Roger, I'm petrified of heights. He said, I am a little bit, John. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go into the middle of the car. We'll be surrounded by the other skiers. We'll hug each other. <laughs> we'll close our eyes. And we'll sing to each other. <laughs> so I said, well, well what, what shall we sing, Roger? He said, We'll meet again. <laughs> I do thank you for that wonderful improvised question. I, and, uh, uh, I think that that's uh, a wonderful note on which to leave it. Uh, we've, we've, I could have this conversation for hours, which I know none of you want me to do. Um, this, for sheer eclectic breadth of experience, you're not going to find another panel like this anywhere in the Doctor Who world today. So will you please join me in thanking very much Mr. John Moreno, Mr. Sean Knopp, and the wonderful Mr. Shane Rimmer. Thank you kindly, again.
to thank you all for being here because you are what makes us really. <laughs>